It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 289 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 11th of March 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And one of our favourite nuclear astrogeophysicists, Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. Welcome back. Hello, nice to be back. Usually I call you a planetary scientist, but I just noticed the other day in your Twitter profile it's a nuclear astrogeophysicist, which sounds even cooler it does, doesn't it? It was a friend of mine who came up with that job title, and I was like, I'm taking that. <laughs> what does it actually mean, though? Well, yeah, so, yeah, it was good, because one thing that made me really happy about this is my this friend is not a scientist, and ah. he suggested that this is what I do, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, what am I? I'm a geophysicist because I'm interested in how planets work from a uh, physical perspective Mm -hmm. um i'm an astro because yeah it's planets rather than the earth and nuclear because i use nuclear methods to do it and he put them all (laughs) together and he said i think you're a nuclear astro geophysicist i'm like i think you sum me up very well (laughs) if the shoe fits (laughs) yep uh very cool so nuclear methods in this case meaning synchrotron radiation and cool stuff like that and neutrons. neutrons Yes, because that's because that's my primary job right now is that I'm a neutron instrument scientist. Very cool. Uh, well, we will probably be talking about some astrogeophysics uh, on the show <laughs> today. Uh, we'll look at what's going on below the clouds of Jupiter, a new classification method for diabetes, uh, Earth's magnetic field reversals, and penguins. Yay. So. Uh, but before that, of course, you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. We greatly support... Uh, no, we don't. We greatly appreciate all the help from the listeners who contribute and support our work. Well, Helen, let's start with some astrogeophysics, shall we? <laughs> and let's look at Jupiter, where the Juno spacecraft has been performing a series of giant elliptical orbits since it got there on July 5th, 2016, I think. And we're now getting a lot of that data back and we're learning a lot about what's happening within the largest planet in our solar system. Yeah, I think this was always the most exciting um, thing for me about Juno. Um, so I've been waiting for these these results to come out for a little bit. <laughs> um, obviously, we've had some incredible pictures i think juno the juno mission has done a, an amazing work i think the probably the most successful instrument at least from the science communication point of view has been juno cam which if the listeners don't know it's a camera that actually um puts out all of its images to the public straight away so anyone could get involved and start um um, mo- putting the mosaics together and making your own images and then you can submit them back to them and there's a beautiful gallery of lots of very very nice pictures um so it's a really nice way for that sounds to- fraught with danger of people um adding little tiny aliens and things to it <laughs> happened i imagine it's quite curated i'm sure and, it is. And certainly a lot of the pictures that we're seeing on in 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 the newspapers and, and online are pictures from juno cam and mm-hmm. pictures that have been put together by the members of the public and That's really cool they get the uh, due attribution for that cool. but um one of the exciting possibilities of Juno was that it was going to be able to measure the gravitational harmonics of the field of Jupiter, the gravitational field of Jupiter, for pretty much the most accurate way we ever have done. Um, so we have sent a big um, satellite to study Jupiter before, that was the Galileo mission, um, which was a great success for a lot of reasons. However, its main antenna broke. Um, not many people probably remember this, but mm. the problem was that it was actually launched from the space shuttle 
and um, it was due to go from I think the next one after I think it was Challenger and unfortunately um, obviously there was a bit of disaster and Challenger blew up um, which meant that Galileo was actually in storage for a lot longer. And because its main antenna was like a, an umbrella, it was due to to open. They didn't check it before they did send it up. And unfortunately, it rusted up and it never opened. So they're always looking at with their backup antenna, which means that in order to probe the gravity field of a planet, um, the best way we have is to send a spacecraft that does a really good orbit and the nice thing about the Juno one, it does actually go a lot, a little bit closer than Galileo ever did mm. as well. There's reasons for that as well, because they designed it to. Um, and the thing you want to monitor is little wobbles in the, the planet, in the sa- satellite's movements as it goes around the planet. I realised I did not find <laughs> it. It's, just, it's, it's one of my favourite words, obviously. It's a great anyway, word. So, <laughs> it's the best word and um, so obviously with Galileo they were able to measure these little perturbations um, quite well but not as well as they could have done with the main antenna so now we fast forward to the future and we've got um, Juno and it's been doing as you say this very highly elliptical orbit and going closer to Jupiter than anything's ever gone before and it's being able to probe these um, these harmonics of the gravitational field more so than ever. So what you do is you can sort of, if, if, if Jupiter was one big fluid body and only um, sort of uh, everything was orbiting in sync, um, its gravitational harmonics would all add up to one. Or at least that I think the J harmonic would be one and then the rest would be zero. But the good thing for us is it's not. It's actually a very interesting body. And so you've got this series of odd harmonics and even harmonics. So the odd ones give us information about the atmosphere. And uh, from that, so there's been four papers published in Nature this week, which is why everyone's got very excited. One paper just measured the harmonics and said, hey, isn't this really cool? (laughs) <laughs> One paper went, hey, look at all these cyclones that sort of link to some of these harmonics. And then two of the other papers, one investigated all the odd harmonics, which gives a lot of information about the movements of the the atmosphere. And another one um, investigated the even ones. Now, for me, the even ones are the most important, or at least for me, the most interesting because they tell you about the interior of the whole of Jupiter. And what they say, well, there's lots of information out of this, as you can probably imagine. But I suppose the key points is, one, the atmosphere is deeper than we ever thought. It's around up to 3,500 kilometres, which is pretty wow. cool. Yeah, wow. it's pretty amazing. Yeah, so all of those band structures that we see on Jupiter – um, go much further deep and there's differential stuff going on. There's basically a whole, I mean, if you think about it, um, the Earth is only 6,400 6, kilometres. So there's a whole sort of half of Earth of atmosphere of stuff going on, which is mm. really cool. Mm. The other big thing um, was that below that, though, below that 3,500 kilometres, um, it looks like... Um, it, um, Jupiter is more together than we thought. It sort of orbits as one big body around. And that's sort of very interesting for me because this is the point where it becomes solid and um, and sort of interesting to think what are the materials at that point at those pressures and temperatures that are, that are going to be there and, and also then generating the magnetic field that again, is quite enormous. We've actually yet to see the big papers about Jupiter's magnetic field for Juno. And so I think when they come out, we'll find out a load more interesting things. So that's so this cool. Is very There's exciting. so much more to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that means then if, if the atmosphere is a lot deeper than we thought, then that core of, uh, is it liquid hydrogen or, or even solid hydrogen? Is that right? Metallic yeah, hydrogen, I mean, sorry. 
we yes so the theory is that it's the pressures are enough to mean that yes hydrogen one is solid and two becomes metallic um but it really is i mean the center of jupiter we think is up to five terapascals and that really is beginning to point get to the point of at what point is matter it's not what we imagine you know it's actually at the point where the nucleus may start breaking down and so it's like what we understand of of atoms may not hold so well in the center of of um of jupiter so um wow there's a yeah we can't get to those pressures in the laboratory just yet um we can get to around a terapascal one terapascal terapa with shock physics um and there was a really cool result a couple of weeks ago looking at water under those sorts of pressures and finding this super ionic phase of water but um those the shock physicists can do that um but they can't go much higher at the moment but you know it's all a matter of building bigger bigger instruments to do those sorts of things so does that kind of mean that there's another field i guess of unknowns uh, in sort of like we have dark matter of things that we don't fully understand like there's this whole new field of what happens under those extreme pressures where matter does weird things yeah absolutely um i know that oh. that's sort of the nuclear physicists certainly are it's sort of the inter it's a really I've seen particle physicists talk about it and nuclear physicists talk about it. And now the high pressure physicists are talking about it. So it's going to be quite interdisciplinary mm. in terms of dark matter. It's not as much stuff as dark <laughs> matter. That's still a lot of stuff that we don't know, mm. but this is all stuff that we kind of know what it should be. And certainly, you know, this is sort of what would happen in the center of a sun. Um, but also more interesting with all the exoplanets we're discovering. They're not they're not stars, not undergoing fusion, so we, we and fission, so we don't they're not generating light like the star is. But these a lot of these exoplanets that have been discovered are gas giants, you know, like Jupiter and Saturn and bigger. Mm. What what is the actual matter in the center of those? So yes, there's a there's a whole heap of stuff still to be done on that. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I I love that we are getting so much cool information from Juno. I am delighted mm -hmm. that it's been pretty much a, a complete success so far. I think there yeah. haven't been any major we glitches. A, we had a bit of a wobble, didn't we? That um, it didn't quite get into the right orbit, if I remember rightly. Oh, okay. And they had to pare down the orbit a little bit, but. Um, I think at the moment it's it's performing well in the mm. bud that they wanted to do. Because the big thing about the magnetic field, of course, is because Galileo, again, this, the spacecraft we sent before, we sent with the magnetometer, but it was too sensitive. And the magnetic field of Jupiter is ferocious. It's, yeah. it's massive. And it fried it um, before it <sighs> got anywhere right. close. So it's kind of exciting. As I say, this is the next really exciting thing will be to hear more about the magnetic field. Um, from the magnetometer results. I think we've had a few, but I think there's much more to come because we've now got a working magnetometer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's still a, a bit of life left in Juno. I think it's uh, got another six months or seven months, I think, until its end of life. Is that right? Yeah, and I think they're going to do a sort of very similar death throes orbit. It's never due to last mm. as long. Cassini I don't know whether there's probably a lot of work behind the scenes because there's no reason why it couldn't last because it's solar powered rather than um, thermo radio generated um, which is, is cool it's cool that we're seeing a solar powered spacecraft that work that mm. far out in the solar system the, the plan is to put it in an orbit like um, Cassini did uh, where it was very, very close within the rings um, and sort of monitor it right to the bitter end. Mm. But um, I think there's a bit of flexibility as to when that happens. Yeah, people forget that Jupiter has rings, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's planned to deorbit uh, at around July 2018, but there is mm. the option that NASA may choose to extend it if there are no technical issues and I assume if there's money still available. Yeah. It's, yeah, generally it's often the money. Yeah. All right. 
Um, now, diabetes is a condition that affects roughly 415 million people around the world, and that's a number that's increasing rapidly. The conventional wisdom has always been that there are three types. Type 1, where the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin to keep uh, blood sugar levels down. Type 2, which is the much more common type, where the body doesn't respond to insulin levels. That's known as insulin resistance. And gestational diabetes, where pregnant women develop high blood sugar, but that usually clears up after the baby is born. But a recent study using data from a Swedish diabetes registry and then confirmed with a number of other data sets indicates that there may in fact be six types of diabetes. Is that right, Penny? Yeah, and I thought this was <clears throat> quite interesting because, I mean, I've always just sort of thought about this, yeah, this conventional idea that there's one which is the autoimmune disease, so type 1, mm -hmm. and then, you know, type 2 where there is insulin but the body doesn't respond and that's generally thought to be caused by, you know, environmental factors or lifestyle factors. But that could be a bit too simplistic. And something I really like about this study is it's not just kind of um, grouping or, you know, identifying these different kinds of diabetes for pure interest, but also because it can help with more targeted treatments and a better understanding of how this disease can be managed. So to the, type, the autoimmune diabetes stays roughly the same, but the other categories um, that have been identified by clustering, and I had a look at the paper and I'm not really <laughs> a statistician. It's a rather but, complicated you know, paper. It's quite a complicated paper, but I think that the, the outcomes I found quite interesting. So you have the autoimmune severe insulin deficient diabetes, severe insulin resistant diabetes, mild obesity related diabetes and mild age related diabetes. And what I find really interesting is that when those clusters are identified and then sort of looking at the treatments that are happening, they're not necessarily receiving the best treatment for their kind of diabetes. For example, um, severe insulin resistant diabetes is linked to obesity. Um, the cells in the body don't actually respond to the in insulin, and these patients have the highest likelihoods of liver disease, kidney disease, and diabetic kidney disease. Now, interestingly, this group had a low proportion of patients who take metformin, mm -hmm. even though they would actually really respond well to that drug. So it's interesting to think that maybe identifying these different clusters can help sort of target different kinds of treatments rather than sort of every individual going through, you know, um, the, you know, oh, we'll try this, we'll try that, try losing weight, mm. you know, all those different things. It might be able to say, well, you know, we think you're in this cluster. Here are the most effective treatments to try first, which would be, Fantastic, because there's some other evidence that the the cells kind of remember their. I don't, I don't know how to express this scientifically, but you know that they've been in a faulty metabolic party, pathway. So the sooner you can get on top of diabetes and treat it, yep. the less long term damage is likely to happen. So I thought this was quite cool. I think the study's been criticised, not criticised, but I mean it's it's important to be aware that it was done in Scandinavia and that population is a lot more homogenous than you might see mm -hmm. in a country like Australia or the United States. But I feel that um, it seems like, you know, as a starting point, it might help lead down the track to more pinpointed treatments and a better understanding of like how and why people develop diabetes, which can only be a good thing. It's not a fun disease. <laughs> No, it's not. Um, I should, Anything is fun, but you know what I mean. I, I should point out I was diagnosed with type 2, well, conventional type 2 uh, diabetes at the start of the year. Um, yeah. But I think what I really like about this is we keep on talking about like the holy grail of medicine is individualized um, mm -hmm. medicine where you can maybe through genetics or uh, through a better diagnosis, you can find out the exact particular ailment that someone's having, whether it be a particular strain of bacteria or a particular 
class of thing. And so the treatment becomes a lot more specialized and specific to the individual, uh, which this is breaking it down into more nuanced groups again. So it'll be exciting to see what happens. Um, Yeah, as you say, it needs a bit more study on a more generalized population, but that'll definitely come, I think. But I'm pretty sure, like, lots of people are thinking, oh, wow, this is fascinating. Let's, you know, let's go there. So, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, I think this was done on those data sets, which are sort of readily available mm. thing. I don't know if maybe in other countries like the US, the UK or Australia there are those data have yeah. that sort of, yeah, um, accounting systems, I guess. But maybe, I don't know, not an endocr- endocrinologist. <laughs> <laughs> um Now, Helen, the Danger Islands might not sound like a very hospitable place. They're freezing cold, they're quite remote, and they're called the Danger Islands. (laughs) But it turns out they're home to a previously unknown super colony of penguins. Uh, What superpowers do you get from a super colony? If you're a super deli penguin, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so this Invisibility is, this is, is my guess. <laughs> yeah, but this is down in Antarctica. And um, um, and I like it because it was a good news story. Because yeah. um, we don't have too many good news stories about <laughs> Antarctica and ecology come up very often, which is good because we've got to be aware of them. But um, so I get the impression from reading the paper, it's a, it's a, it's an open access paper, which is which is great cool. um, in scientific reports, and it's quite readable actually. Unlike the the diabetes one, which I <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah. a statistician. I can I, I was very happy that lots of good people had written lots of good stuff about that one because that was, as you say, really interesting. Um, so I think the problem is penguins are hard to spot from satellite data because they're black and white. <laughs> and they play <laughs> very well with their surroundings and I think previously they've done this like by finding them because of their poo yeah um because you can see penguin poo everywhere um but again with the delis this is difficult because they're one of the two species that live on the ice um uh they can't always detect it from outer space so the idea was that um, some people have been doing um actual let's go there and count the penguins um, and as far as I can work out, they went to this island or this group of islands called the Danger Islands, which could be imagined that not many people have gone to very often because mm. of the name. <laughs> and um, they actually got on the ground and they counted a load of penguins. And I think that um, uh, one of the islands had been counted and they had found a few there. But they've now done a survey of all the group of islands and found that there are more penguins there than all of the penguins known before. So something like um, a couple of million penguins discovered. They didn't oh. count penguins. They um, they used drones and they sort of did some statistics in terms of analysing what the penguins were there. Um, but it's, it's pretty exciting because I think in another region of Antarctica, they've actually seen the Adelie penguin numbers go down quite dramatically. There's another number of reasons. One could be that the retreating of the sea ice is causing problems Mm. and also the movement of their food source, the krill, um, due to ocean current changing. So they're pretty excited to have found a whole new heap of penguins. Yes. Um, Heap the collective noun for a penguin. In fact, that's the next question. What's the collective noun for a penguin? Oh. Oh. (laughs) Or something. Um. I'm (laughs) <laughs> um, so there's something for someone to write in with um, but they found a lot of penguins and um, obviously it means that they can revise the fact that oh there must be a lot of food there for them um, and also have a bit of a better of an idea of the impact of the environment on the penguin population so um, I think it generally was very good news and the other cool thing that they'd used for the first time was these drones in order to, mm. to count the penguins and there was a lot of kind of funny stories about how to get the drones to work that it was challenging because the magnetic field down there is is trap is challenging to navigate in but also the batteries kept on freezing and dumping the charge so there was one story that the 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 investigators found it easier if they kept the batteries in their jumpers (laughs) 
So I thought that was really cool. You got a nice picture of obviously a really nice result. Let's find all mm. the penguins because the Delhi penguins seem to be some of the cooler penguins that I've seen. Oh. Um, they seem to have a bit of an aptitude, which is kind Helen, of fun. They're all cool. I know, but <laughs> these ones, they, they seem cheekier than most. <laughs> And uh, and um, and uh, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of them, so that's that's really cool. So I thought it was a really nice story. It is, and I just did a quick Google, and you'll be pleased to know that a group of penguins in the water is called a raft, and oh. a group of penguins on land is called a waddle. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was right. Oh, that's awesome. That is it's like my. I think waddle, that's good. My oh, favourite wow. collective noun is for wombats. Oh, what's that? They're called a wisdom. A wisdom of wombats. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but now a waddle of penguins might be my second. <laughs> I think so. Very cool. All right, Penny, let's get crazy and mix archaeology and geophysics, shall we? Of course, all the time. (laughs) I think a lot of people are aware that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped many times over the last 4.5 billion years. But thanks to a tribe of people that lived in the Limpopo River Valley in what is now Botswana, South Africa and Zimbabwe, we have an extraordinary new source of information about these flips, don't we? Yeah, and I thought this was really interesting from my um, oh, too many years ago now memories <laughs> of learning about this, I was like, oh, yeah, we know everything there is to know about the flipping of the magnetic field because it's all there in, you know, oceanic crust and we can look mm-hmm. at the reversals and it's great. And I guess to step back a bit, the magnetic field is one of the things that lets us live on the Earth. Um, it protects us from all sorts of... Um, Solar radiation. Yes, that's the word I was for. <laughs> things that come, like things that come from the sun, um, and it's also kind of useful. Like animals and birds, we think of oh, animals, including birds, use it to navigate. We obviously use magnetism and compasses and so on for all sorts of different things, and we know that it flips back and forth every two to three hundred thousand years Mm -hmm. and it's coming on eight hundred thousand years so probably gonna happen now any minute now and i am so torn between hoping it happens in my (laughs) lifetime hoping it doesn't Uh, (laughs) my opinion i don't want it to happen in my lifetime (laughs) but just aren't you curious (laughs) anyway (laughs) curious Well, okay, anyway. so let's just dwell on that for a little yeah. mo- uh, moment, though. Like, how long does it normally take for this flip to happen? Is this something that happens overnight? Is it over 100,000 years or do we know? I think the last estimate was around 10,000 years. And okay. the, I think there's a, there's a bit of a decline in the field and then it sort of goes away and then it, it sort of ramps back up again. Um, but uh, this is just from magnetohydrodynamic simulations of the earth um which are only improving but i mm. think i think the term is if it goes we can expect it to be gone for 10,000 years or so well, i think that's something that we can probably adjust for mm. with most of our technology i would have thought 10,000 year flip <laughs> <laughs> well the worrying thing is we are seeing it wander now the yeah. the magnetic north wandered a lot and we are seeing it start to decline a little bit so okay yeah which brings us back to this study um (laughs) so as helen says we've noticed it's getting weaker it's wandering the pole is wandering and so on there's a spot um called the south atlantic anomaly which is quite a weak spot and it struggles straddles south america and southern africa and this is where this study comes in because we're now trying to look at a really more fine-grained time, sta- time scale and one of the really great uh, places that you can get information about what the mag- um, magnetic field has been doing, not so much in the hundreds of thousands of years or in the, you know, decades since we've been measuring it, is by looking at archaeological sites. So where things um, have been burned or something or reach high temperatures um, you can get an indication of what's going on with the magnetic field based on the way that the minerals align. 
However, for various political, blah, 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 all sorts of reasons, most archaeological data comes from above the equator. So if we're thinking about what's been going on in the past 2,000 years with the magnetic field, it's a really northern hemisphere-centric kind of view. So that's why this site is interesting. Um, so apparently, about a 1,000 years ago, um, Bantu-speaking people living in the Limpopo River Valley when there was a drought, they would ritually cleanse their villages by burning down their huts and burning down their grain bins. And these fires got really, really hot and in the process left geomagnetic records. So when the clay gets burned at really high temperatures, those magnetic minerals in it are stabilised and then when they cool down, they lock in a record of what the magnetic field was. So, oh, what so you the- get like a snapshot. Of a snapshot the of what field it was. at that time. So similar to what's happening in oceanic crust where the um, volcanic minerals mm-hmm. cool down in alignment and you can see kind of a pattern of reversals, a similar thing here. So hot rocks, the, mag- the minerals can align to the magnetic field. When they cool down, then they're stuck. So what this has shown us is that this um, in the 5th and 8th centuries AD, the magnetic field in the region was rapidly changing direction like it is today, which suggests that this anomaly is the latest version of something that has been long going on in the area and it could have something to do with shifting magnetic poles. So, yeah, we still don't know when the poles are going to reverse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Any day now. <laughs> Any day well, I've been reading a science fiction series which is kind of geologically based, which has really made me think about kind of natural disasters and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. So, What's the series? Oh, it's called, oh, what was the first one called? The Fifth Season. And mm. I can't give too much away without spoilers. Okay. But the, the author, I think, got a fellowship to go and work with, oh, gosh, I should have looked this up, with NASA or someone. And so actually learned a lot of geology and essentially it's a very, very far in the future earth where there's all sorts of um, these seasons which are kind of geological crises where civilization Mm -hmm. breaks down, people have to kind of survive it and then rebuild afterwards. But some people have the powers to manipulate geology. I haven't done it justice if I was thinking of it actually. Planned it, but it's very good. The author's um, N.K. Jemison. Yeah, it's in the Broken Earth is the series that it's in. So. There you go. Thank you. I think that's I, I think that's really an interesting point that you that that work has made that most of our archaeological geophysical results have come from the northern hemisphere. Yeah, hmm. and uh, that's that's really cool that they're getting more southern hemisphere data because they really do need that complete picture. I was yeah. just thinking whether Australia might have specific sites for doing, because there's a lot of um, iron ochre used um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the in the indigenous population here, and so I wonder if there might be sites for doing the same thing. But and uh, surely you'd think in Australia, lots of burning and high temperatures yeah. and mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and I mean especially because the Curie point on some of the iron minerals isn't that high, and so you know around 50 60 degrees c so that's the that that revert re, that point where you get above that temperature and the magnetic spins go all over the place and then you cool back down and then they lock back in exactly what you're saying right. um but um yeah you're right actually you could naturally get to those sorts of temperatures yeah hmm. we do have a lot of bushfires but yeah it did make me think yeah. I, I like the idea that the, this is a tribe who without even realizing it have created a data source about the earth's magnetic field like this is their legacy is something completely unintentional and really cool it is cool and i do like i do like it when my favorite sort of things come Mm -hmm. together like this like i would you know in another life i would have loved to be an archaeological scientist but yeah there you go all right (laughs) well i think that's our show uh, as usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 289. Please leave us feedback there or on social media. And if you can, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate 
and pledging to support us on Patreon. Dr. Helen Maynard Casely, it is always a joy to have you on the program. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Anytime. Is there anything you wanted to plug or steer people towards? Um, oh, yes. Um, so I've just published a paper this week about um, materials on Titan. Oh, awesome. And um, I, I should probably write something um, for the conversation about it in the next couple of weeks. So what we're doing is that with um, Titan, one thing Cassini showed was that there's not that much water ice on the surface. There's actually a lot of organic, small organic molecules, and they're coming from um, the, uh, the the solar wind and cosmic radiation is breaking down the nitrogen and the methane in the atmosphere of Titan, and then all of this stuff is raining down and sludging down on the surface. And so um, myself and my collaborators sort of took the view of, okay, so what are the actual solids? that are forming we know a bit about the chemistry what's the solids and we've done a bit of a survey of the known ones and revealed quite a lot of unknowns so oh. that's basically my career for the next 20 years sorted. <laughs> <laughs> so um but luckily i also get to write a paper going hmm, this is what i'm going to try and look at for the next 20 years Very or so cool. so um that was kind of fun so uh, Excellent. yes so that that's that's been my most exciting Thank well done. Congratulations <laughs> on getting published. Thank you. And thank you for joining me today, Penny. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. People were out observing the aurora, and they started noticing something that was overhead as well when they were seeing the aurora far to the northern regions. It was unlike most aurora. Talk to the scientists, we didn't know what it was. And together, they said, we'll keep taking observations and we'll call it Steve in the meantime. Steve is mostly a very narrow purple arc and sometimes it has these little green features that go along with it as well that are kind of like waving fingers or a picket fence. That means that there's plasma physics happening up there to cause that light and to make these little discrete features that we don't understand.